he was the first to write a full-length commentary on all of Daniel. And because of that, he's got a lot to say. He links the head of gold from chapter 2 and the winged lion from chapter 7 together, representing Babylon as the first empire. Then he explains how Nebuchadnezzar's episode of going insane in Daniel 4 coincided with his prophecy in chapter 7. He then moves on saying that the Persians were the second empire as the bare and silver portion of the statue. The interesting thing here is that he lists the three ribs in the bear's mouth as the Persians, Medes, and Babylonians, which is kind of weird as the Persian bear would then essentially be eating itself in his interpretation, but that's if you incorporate the devouring language in. Then, he said that the Greeks are the third empire as being the four-headed, four-winged leopard and brass section on the statue, and that the four heads and four wings signify the Greeks, Greek empires split into the four ruling territories after Alexander's death, which he then finishes identifying the fourth empire as Rome. What gets really interesting here is that Hippolytus mentions how the fourth empire is still standing in his time that then leaves the need to discuss the partly of iron and of clay and on the toes on the statue in his commentary. He says, after this then, what remains beloved but the toes of the feet of the image, which in which part shall be of iron and part of clay mixed together. By the toes of the feet he met mystically the ten kings that arise out of that kingdom. As Daniel says, I consider the beast, and lo, there were ten horns behind, among which shall come up another little horn springing from them, by which none other is met than the Antichrist that is to rise, and he shall set up the kingdom of Judah. The eyebrow raiser here is Hippie's comment that the Antichrist is still to come, so he is taking a futurist view with Daniel 2 and 7 since the Roman Empire was still standing at his time. But he said this figure is going to set up or reestablish the kingdom of Judah. He goes on saying, that the three kings who will be slain by the Antichrist are Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. Why them? Not sure. Then says the following, And when he has conquered all, he will prove himself a terrible and savage tyrant, and will cause tribulation and persecution to the saints, exalting himself against them. And after him it remains that the stone shall come from heaven which smote the image, and shivered it, and subverted all the kingdoms, and gave the kingdom to the saints of the Most High. This became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. As these things then are destined to come to pass, and as the toes of the image turn out to be democracies, and the ten horns of the beast are distributed among the ten kings, let us look at what is before us more carefully, and scan it, as it were, with open eye. So, he specifies that the ten toes represent democratic kingdoms, and that everyone should be attentive for watching out for their eventual rise. He repeats his identification of the four empires, and that the ten kings are still to come just after this, and that the stone should be understood as Jesus coming to judge the earth. So, this is clearly talking about Jesus' second coming, but Hippolytus goes on predicting that he knows when all this will happen with the following reason. But that we may not leave our subject at this point undemonstrated, we are obliged to discuss the matter of the times, of which a man should not speak hastily because they are a light to him. For as the times are noted from the foundation of the world, and reckoned from Adam, they set clearly before us the matter with which our inquiry deals. So, he is saying that chronology, or history of the world, is tied to the eschatological point. 
he continues on. For the first appearance of our Lord in the flesh took place in Bethlehem under Augustus in the year 5500, and he suffered in the 33rd year. And 6,000 years must need needs be accomplished in order that the Sabbath may come, the rest, the holy day, on which God rested from all his works. For the Sabbath is the type and emblem of the future kingdom of the saints, when they shall reign with Christ, when he comes from heaven, as John says in his Apocalypse. For a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Since then, in six days God made all things, it follows that six thousand years must be fulfilled, and they are not yet fulfilled. As John says, five are fallen, one is, that is, the sixth, and the other is not yet come. A couple passing notes here is that the reference to a day is as a thousand years comes from two places in the Bible. My interjection on this is that Hippolytus chose not to finish the quote that says a thousand years are as one day. That's big when you hear someone advocating for a creation week model of history by using these verses to support their position. It's much like using the day year principle in places where it shouldn't be used. And the key word here for everyone on this little sidebar topic is the word as. The psalmist and Peter did not say is. And the other note is his citation of Revelation 17.10. He is saying that this verse is in reference to the sixth millennium of history that he was currently living in. Thus, the one yet to come would be the thousand-year Sabbath rest period that is referred to as day, today as the millennial kingdom that comes from Revelation 24 that says the saints will live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So, you can see how one could build this type of model, but it needs to be pointed out that Hippolytus' citation of Revelation 17.10 was shortened because the beginning said that there are seven kings, then talked about five fallen, one is, one is yet to come, and that one yet to come was he who is to come for a short period of time. And John's very next verse says, the one to come is a beast empire, that is, the eighth. So you can see that Hippolytus was playing fast and loose with scripture to make it fit inside of his system. But how he came to the 5,500 year determination is pretty unique, not to mention in passing. He said its mystery is learned by the adding together of the cubic dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant instructed to Moses by God. And since their sum is five and a half cubits, that this signified mysteriously 5,500 years until the coming of the Messiah. Now, with this view of history and eschatology of his in mind, is that he says, 500 years remain to make up the 6,000. Then the end shall come. So, he would be expecting at most another 300 years to come to pass before Christ's second coming. Now, with all of this in mind, let's move on to his 70 weeks interpretation, where he will start by covering the 7 and 62 weeks of verse 25. He says, Having mentioned therefore seventy weeks, and having divided them into two parts, in order that what was spoken by him to the prophet might be better understood, he proceeds thus, Unto Christ the Prince shall be seven weeks, which make forty-nine years. So, what Hippolytus declared was that there are two Mashiachs in this passage, with the first coming at the end of the first seven weeks. Because, he says, it was in the 21st year that Daniel saw these things in Babylon. 
Hence, the 49 years added to the 21 make up 70 years of which the blessed Jeremiah spoke. With this, he identifies Joshua, the high priest, as the first Mashiach in the prophecy. He reasons this because for all the kings and priests were styled Christ because they were anointed with the holy oil which Moses of old prepared. This is important this is important to us because it's something that the rabbinic side will say today as well. They will say that a Mashiach is just someone who is anointed. So it then leaves the door wide open for the prophecy to be referring to any high priest in the first century AD that could be understood as someone who was cut off or killed. What they are trying to say there is that this prophecy is far from definitive that the King Messiah was predicted to be executed. But what we have already discussed is that the special holy anointing oil was absent come the first century because the examples found in the Old Testament never occur during the second temple period. And even when Maccabees discussed the new temple objects being constructed or the new high priest being installed after Antiochus's defilement was that they were simply dedicated afresh, not anointed with the holy oil. Now, Hippolytus says that the 62 weeks following led up to Jesus' birth and that he was the second Mashiach predicted in verse 26. Now, if you have an active chronology going on in your head this entire time, is that 520 subtracted by 434 lands you at 86 BC, which is obviously not even close to Jesus' birth year. That's correct, but that didn't stop him from justifying it with the following. After the return of the people from Babylon, there was a space of 434 years until the time of the birth of Christ. May be easily understood, for since the first covenant was given to the children of Israel after a period of 434 years, it follows that the second covenant also should be defined by the same space of time in order that it might be expected by the people and easily recognized by the faithful. I hope again that you are seeing that he is playing fast with scripture here once again, as he was likely referring to Exodus 1240, but there it reads 430 years, not 434. And in regards to lining up Persian and Greek reigns, to justify the 85 years is that he uh, didn't address it at all. <laughs> now, before he gets into the 70th week, is that Hippie said that Jesus was the most holy from verse 24. It's just something that I want to keep us tracking on as we discussed, as we have already discussed how debated and somewhat controversial point six is within the church itself. Now his 70th week. For when the three score and two weeks are fulfilled, and Christ is come, and the gospel is preached in every place, the times being then accomplished, there will remain only one week, the last in which Elijah will appear and Enoch. This is drawing upon Revelation 11's, Revelation 11's two witnesses who come preaching and do supernatural acts. He likely chose Elijah and Enoch as they were both describing, de both described being taken to heaven with no mention of their death ever taking place. He finishes saying, And in the midst of it, the abomination of desolation will be manifested by the Antichrist announcing desolation to the world. And when he comes, the sacrifice and oblation will be removed, which now are offered to God in every place by the nations. Now, because we know that Hippolytus', Hippolytus view that the Antichrist is rise as a still future event, and that 6,000 years will be the culmination before Christ's second coming, is that he is casting the 70th week to the same eschatological point 
ending around the year 500 AD or year 6000 from creation in his reckoning. Thus, he is the first writer to definitively have a gap or parentheses between the end of the 69th week and the start of the 70th week. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, leave a comment, and don't forget to visit us at JustScripture.org. But in the meantime, stay salty.